-hmm. Okay, Hi, I'm going to be talking about canine allergy treatments since a lot of dogs have allergies. Um, so there are four common types of allergies, flea, food, contact, and environmental. Um, flea, food, and contact are pretty easy to treat as long as you prevent fleas, prevent contact with the allergen, or uh, change their diet. But environmental allergies are a lot harder to pinpoint and they're a lot harder to treat. So I'm going to be going over these sorts of treatments, um, but first a bit of overview on the type 1 hypersensitivity that we call allergies. Uh, an antigen presenting cell presents an antigen to T cells that then activate B cells to produce um, uh, IgE, which is a specific type of antibody that crossbinds the allergen to a mast cell and activates the mast cell to release a lot of things that cause a lot of the symptoms associated with allergies. Um, so these are the five most common uh, allergy treatments for canines, and I'll go through them. Yeah, so this one I forgot about. <laughs> This, it looks a lot more complicated than it is. Um, so on this last slide, I mentioned the T cell activation. Uh, these allergies are really an imbalance between Th2 cells and Th1 cells. So helper T cell type one and two. Th2 cells are the ones that are more active in um, allergies and they produce um, all these different cytokines. IL-4 activates more Th2 cells and restarts the process. It also activates B cells to produce the antibody IgE and eosinophils uh, to produce IL-3 that activates mast cells. IL-5 is a growth factor for eosinophils to make IL-3 activate mast cells. IL-10 is actually an anti-inflammatory, but it's dramatically outbalanced by the rest <coughs> of its response. IL-13 is kind of weird. Um, it's really similar to IL-4 in that it activates B cells to produce IgE. Um, it also has some roles playing with uh, cancer, and so that's fun. And IL-31 is one of the main uh, symptom-inducing cytokines. It's the one that is responsible for the itchy sensation. But the IgE and IL-3 produced go on to activate and promote growth in mast cells, which also release uh, cytokines, specifically histamine, and that goes, feeds back into the entire process, and it's just kind of this fun feedback loop of itching and allergy inflammation. So I'm gonna start with antihistamines since they're kind of the go-to, easiest to get. Um, so there are two types, H1 receptor antagonists and inverse agonists. They both do pretty much the same thing, bind to the H1, the histamine receptor, um, on the target tissue, and prevent histamine from binding. Uh, but the inverse agonist is kind of a funky term. It binds to the receptor and actually uh, reverses some of the histamine's effects. Um, and of those two types, there are two more types, first and second generation. Um, first generation antihistamines generally cross the blood-brain blood barrier, and those are the ones that are going to cause your drowsiness. Um, which can be a good thing because it could provide some relief at night from itching, but it could be a bad thing if you take it during the day or you don't want your dog to be drowsy and lethargic. Um, so they may help with mild allergies, but are pretty unimpressive and not particularly useful if there is some sort of severe inflammation or itching. Um, not for dogs with seizure activity, cardiovascular disease, or high blood pressure, and they may have drug interactions. So that takes the fun, not complicated flow chart from this to that. So if you saw the histamine effects were kind of lessened. So steroids are the next um, treatment and they suppress nearly every component of the inflammatory process. Um, so they inhibit clonal expansion of the B and T cells. They reduce the number of circulating um, inflammatory cells and they bind intracell intracellularly to alter expression of corticosteroid responsive genes. So uh, when those genes are activated, they are expressing proteins to help produce all of the inflammatory symptoms 
and steroids will suppress just about everything. They also block the synthesis of the Th2 cytokines, interleukins, and histamine complement, and PAF. And so this chart on the right is um, relative activity of various steroids, and you see it has glu glucocorticoid and mineral corticoid. That's because they both have some, or each steroid has both functions in it, uh, just in differing amounts, and I put color on it because it was it's useless without color. Um, side effects of steroids, since it is such an aggressive treatment, include uh, polydipsia, polyuria, increased hunger, which can result in obesity, lethargy, UTIs, and increased susceptibility to infection since, ah, since the entire um, immune system is suppressed. And there are a lot more drug interactions with steroids than there are with some of the other treatment options. So it takes the flow chart from looking like this to like this. It wipes out almost the entire thing. Um, so before I move on to the next one, I'm gonna go over the JAK stat pathway. Uh, so JAK is a kinase, it's the Janus kinase, and it's important in one of the uh, pathways for cytokines to communicate with cells. So cytokines don't actually enter the cell, they bind to a membrane receptor uh, that activates JAK, which then phosphorylizes STAT, which is signal transducers and activators of transcription. Those are phosphorylated, they dimerize, phosphorylated, they dimerize, and they uh, are transported to the nucleus where they modulate gene transcription for specific genes. So Apoquel, uh, Apoquel capitalizes on this process because it is a selective JAK inhibitor for JAKs 1 and 3. There are three of them and then another, but JAKs 1 and 3. So uh, those ones are specific to interleukins 2, 4, 6, 13, and 31. If you remember, 4 and 13 were responsible for activating B cells and uh, creating IgE, and 31 was responsible for the itching sensation. So this is for clients who are itchy and have inflammation. Um, there are mild side effects. They're not frequently uh, experienced by dogs, and that's by vomiting and diarrhea, and there aren't really any drug interactions. Uh, so it just crosses out the pathway, uh, so the cytokine doesn't actually have any effect on cells. So your flow chart, I bolded the uh, cytokines that are affected by Apoquel, and this happens. So if you notice, um, IL-31 is uh, taken out of the equation, so all of that um, itching sensation disappears. I say disappears, I mean is lessened. Um, and also a lot of the uh, self-feeding loop is taken out of the question because IL-4 and 13 are stopped. Cytopoint is kind of a neat one. It's different from the others because it's considered a non-drug uh, therapy. Um, what it is is an antibody specific to IL-31, the interleukin that causes the itching sensation. And uh, it's recommended for patients younger than 12 months, which Apoquel is not, and for patients who tend to show side effects to medications. Um, so what it does is it by, or, uh, Typically, IL-31 will bind to this receptor, and if you see here, this is the JAK-STAT pathway again. Um, so it just goes through that entire JAK-STAT pathway that I mentioned earlier, but side of point, the antibody will bind to IL-31 and prevents its binding to the uh, receptor. So what this does is it gets rid of IL-31's effects, which is just the itching. But since it is just getting rid of the itching sensation, there is no effect on inflammation. So it's not recommended for patients who have severe inflammation associated with their allergy. Lastly, immunotherapy is kind of a neat one because uh, it focuses away from mitigating symptoms and more on preventing them in the first place um, by trying to desensitize the patient to the allergen. So there are a couple kinds, uh, mostly allergen specific and sublingual. One is a shot, the other is a drop under your tongue. Um, but for the sake of this, I'm going to just combine them into one and call them immunotherapy. Um, so it's trying to rebalance the immune response from the Th2 dominated response to a Th1 response that doesn't have that crazy loop. Um, 
So there are no side effects, uh, but it may not be very effective. It just depends on the patient and the allergen. Uh, so step one is skin testing to determine what the allergen is. Step two is the allergy shots, where you're kind of figuring out the right dose to induce the desensitization without being ineffective. Um, and because you are introducing the allergen to the patient, you need to have them on some sort of other medication to help with their symptoms. And then you reassess after one year to see how effective it's been. On the right, I have a little graph that shows the effects of immunotherapy. Um, you'll see an increase in T regulatory cell uh, induction and TH2 suppression a decrease in IgE, an increase in IgG, a uh, decrease in skin test reactivity, and in mast cell degranulation, creating overall a uh, decrease in sensitivity to the allergen. So that kind of gets rid of the whole thing, is the goal. And this is Baloo, he's my son. Um, so he has environmental allergies. These are not flattering pictures because they were really bad when they took them. On the left, that's him eating wind outside the car. And uh, his eyeball looks pretty ugly because it's swollen and there's hair loss from all of his itching. And then on the right, he's wearing a donut so he doesn't, uh, yeah, so he doesn't eat his butt or scratch his ears. And he has a bandaid on his nose because he was snuffling so much he actually rubbed it raw from all the itching. Poor boy. So he has environmental allergies, which we treat with Apoquil but it can be hard when you insist on wearing the uh, environment in your beard. Yeah. <laughs> He's so pretty. That's it. He's pretty. I have Let's sources. Give, give her a round of applause. That was a lesson in immunology, if you didn't uh, realize it. Questions, comments, I'll let you, well, I've got a few things to ask her, but yeah. <laughs> I've got to give you a quiz, you know that. Anybody, I mean, the environmental ones, do you have any idea? What, what he's allergic to, you know what I mean? Um, I know it's something seasonal because they more or less go away in the winter and okay. they're very bad in the summer. Okay, so it's something seasonal. Um, At least that helped you a little bit. Yeah. I have a friend whose dog is allergic to dust mites, so she has to keep all of her food in the fridge, like dry food, wet food, all has to be stored. Open the dog food has to be in, stored, in, be stored someplace. Okay. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's interesting. I mean, those are the hardest things to track down when you don't know what you're fighting, okay? Mm -hmm. And notice how you have a uh, almost uh, a buffet of possible treatments to do. That was one thing I was buffet. studying. All the what's that? A whole buffet. A buffet, right? There's. You know, like if when people get allergies, kind of thing, they just like put a little bit of the allergen under their skin and like vapor to pop up, to kind of like. Are you asking if, if that's what they yeah. do? Can they not do that for dogs, like patch testing? That is what they do for dogs. Uh, they do skin tests or blood tests. The thing is, or a skin test is the gold standard for allergy testing in dogs. Uh, however, some allergens don't produce a, uh, a response on the skin, so it can be hit or miss. But uh, by and large, that's the testing that they do use when determining what to treat for immunotherapy. So that'd be like number one, the sensitivity to allergen? Uh, the, yeah, the skin number test. one, okay. and then in steps, skin testing. Okay. okay. So yeah, skin test or blood test, like people. So if you get something positive that's probably reacting to it, I'm not doing the skin test now, so that would be a true positive. But if something's negative, it still could be allergic to that allergen, but it's just not showing up on the skin test, mm -hmm. right? Very interesting. Uh, go back to where all the, where the first chart, where the first uh, highway there, because it was kind of interesting um, there. These interleukins are numbered in, in this makes a lot of sense. They try to not give them names because sometimes when you name something, then years later you find out it really doesn't do that and there's like this thing. So somebody was smart with the interleukins, they just said, let's start numbering them as we discover them. And interleukin one is very famous. I mean, it's maybe not even up there because it's a pyrogen. It's what causes an animal to, or people to have a fever. And when I was taking an immunology course when I was in graduate school, I think I remember up through 24. So th this is the first time I saw 31. I go, wow, they're still progressing. What's that? Recently discovered. Yeah, yeah, it had to be, because when I was in graduate school, two, three years ago, okay, not don't laugh too loud, it's being recorded. <laughs> I remember, I think I want to remember, we studied up to 24. 
But it's very interesting. Thank goodness they haven't named it like some of our other things that we name and then like follicle stimulating hormone. Well, that works in men too, you know what I mean? Those kind of things. Um, and then you mentioned the blood brain barrier someplace mm -hmm. in your presentation. And the histamines. Okay, yeah. And here's the deal. Uh, if there's something going on in the brain, you know, and you said it causes drowsiness, which one causes it? Was it, a dr uh, it was a drug, right? Generally yeah. first generation. So okay. Benadryl, Dramamine, Allegra, okay. Zyrtec, Claritin. Right. Because if something doesn't cross the blood brain barrier, then it won't have any effect on behavior or what you're doing. So the key is the blood brain barrier is more of a concept than like some people think, is that like a, a sheet around the brain? But that's the meninges, right? There's three layers of the meninges, the dura mater, and so forth. That's like a sheet around the brain. But the blood brain barrier is every place where there's blood next to brain tissue. It's a capillary wall. And usually capillary walls are very leaky, but in the brain, they're tight, and it's called the blood brain barrier. Some people you know, don't remember that. And very, it's very selective of what gets in. If it's a general anesthetic, or some drug that causes drowsiness, that's got to cross the blood-brain barrier. So the point. And then the steroid chart, the relative. <clears throat> this was like pat. But look at all these steroids. And some of them are natural, and some of them are man-made, like the top one, cortisol. What's really interesting is she's saying one and one. So it has glucocorticoid activity, and it has an equal amount of mineral corticoid activity. And then my one question before I go on is, the duration effect, is that still a relative number? It's not hours or anything like that. No, it's, it's a, a relative. Yeah. yeah. So you know, it's got. You can think of it as it has X number. Uh, it's got a one uh, duration. But then go down to dexamethasone, third to the bottom. It's 25 times more activity than cortisol for glucocorticoid glucocorticoid activity, but it has zero activity in mineral corticoid. So that's very specific. And dexamethasone is used for a lot of things. And the beta methasone right below it is very powerful too, and it's 25 times more powerful than the cortisol, but it still has zero mineral corticoid. But then they're longer lasting, three times the, the amount of uh, duration on those. So that's like, that's a great chart. If you're ever dealing with some of these things, you know, how powerful is it? And so like death of Mexico, methazone, I used to give it to cattle that I wanted to give birth and you have to do this near the end of gestation, of course. And look at it, it's 25, more, 25 times more powerful than like cortisol. So I thought, I thought that was a great relative thing. Anybody else? Comments? Questions? Okay, I'm going to shut off the recorder.